Cancer of the Colon and Rectum. This is one of a series of videos found on the website about cancer.com. This is commonly referred to as colorectal cancer. This is a common cancer, the third most common cancer in the United States, accounting for about 9% of cancers in both men and women. The odds of ever developing this cancer is about 5%. It's a bit more common in men than women, certainly much lower than the risk of ever getting breast cancer or prostate cancer. The incidence of this cancer has been declining over the last 30 years or so. This is a lethal cancer. It's the third most common cause of cancer death, accounting for about 9% of cancer deaths in both men and women. The mortality has been declining in the last 30 years or so, both for men and for women as noted on these curves. The odds of ever dying of this cancer is about 2%. This isn't much lower than prostate or breast cancer as noted on this table. The symptoms can be abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, or rectal bleeding. Many patients are diagnosed before they have symptoms based on a screening colonoscopy or the finding of blood in the stool called hematochesia. Patients who have symptoms have a worse outcome than patients who are picked up before they have symptoms, 49% versus a 71% five-year survival. So ideally, this cancer should be diagnosed at the earliest possible stage. The median age for patients with this cancer is 60s and even early 70s in women for colon cancer, as noted. Rectal cancer patients are slightly younger. The odds of being diagnosed with this cancer before the age of 50 is fairly low. 8% of colon cancer and 14% of rectal cancer patients were diagnosed before they turned 50. This age is important because 50 is the age at which colonoscopy screening is recommended. This is generally done every 10 years once a patient turns 50. Certain patients, though, are high risk and should get screened at an earlier age. The NCCN does have a very detailed section on colorectal screening that can be accessed on their website. For instance, an average risk patient would be someone who's never had polyps, cancer, or inflammatory bowel disease and who does not have a family history. A higher risk patient would be someone who had these symptoms or problems or was diagnosed as having a high risk cancer syndrome. By positive family history, it's always more serious if you have a first-degree relative who had cancer at a young age. A first-degree relative would be a parent, child, or sibling. And if a first-degree relative had this cancer before the age of 50, or two first-degree relatives who had cancer at any age, then you're considered high risk and you should start getting screening at the age of 40. Otherwise, for most patients, the age of 50. If you're diagnosed with colon cancer before starting into therapy, the initial things that should be reviewed would be the pathology. A colonoscopy should normally be done to look for other polyps or other cancers in the bowel, and certain staging studies such as CAT scans or PET scans to determine if the cancer has spread. If the cancer appears localized, the patient would normally undergo a bowel resection. And the pathology report should be reviewed for a number of critical things. One confirming that this is, in fact, invasive malignant cancer, usually adenocarcinoma. Determining the stage, which is based on the depth of invasion and the number of lymph nodes involved, it's recommended that the surgeon remove at least 12 lymph nodes to be sure this area has been resected properly. The surgical margins are important to ensure that the cancer has been completely removed. There are other prognostic risk factors that can be considered, such as the grade, vascular invasion, or perineural invasion, if these are noted, the patient has a higher risk of a relapse. There are tip-offs that the patient may have a genetic type of cancer, and the pathologist may want to look for MSI, microsatellite instability, or tests for MMR protein to make sure the patient doesn't have the Lynch syndrome. And there are other genetic mutations that can be tested, such as KRAS and BRAF, that will determine whether the patient would benefit from EGFR blocking drugs such as cetuximab, and this may become increasingly important in the future. Rectal cancer is a bit different. Along with the staging as described in colon, 
it's common to get an endorectal ultrasound or pelvic MRI. This is important because patients with rectal cancer need to be staged prior to surgery. If they have advanced rectal cancer, they should get radiation and chemo prior to surgery. An endorectal ultrasound is often very useful to determine the depth of the cancer in the rectum and to look for lymph nodes. And studies show an ultrasound is generally more accurate than a CAT scan or an MRI to determine this. The staging system is based primarily on the depth, not the size, how deep the cancer has gone into the bowel wall and the number of lymph nodes. The TNN system is used as in all cancers. T stands for tumor stage and again with colon and rectum this is basically how deep the cancer invaded and there are guidelines that would, the pathologist would normally comment on the so-called T stage. The N is involvement of lymph nodes and in colon and rectal cancer it's the number of lymph nodes that are critical and these are combined to develop the staging system. Again any of these slides can be paused for further review. The di stage distribution is often scattered about as you can see here stage 1, 2, 3, and 4 often because colon cancer is not diagnosed in the earliest stages. Rectal cancer stage distribution is about the same. A bit more stage 1's because it's a little easier to diagnose rectal cancer earlier. The best advice on treatment is often found on the website of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network at nccn.org. This is quite complicated and patients may want to ask their doctor to review the current NCCN guidelines with them to ensure that they're getting the most current advice on treatment. And the guidelines would look like this, both colon and rectum are separate. And in simple terms, the treatment of colorectal cancer, if it's an early stage, the patient will have surgery. For more advanced stages, it would be surgery followed by chemotherapy for colon cancer or with radiation and with rectal cancer chemotherapy and radiation prior to surgery. For patients who have metastases or recurrence the treatment is generally chemotherapy or targeted therapy and possibly there's a role for radiation surgery or radiofrequency ablation if the area of metastases is a small area such as a small liver cancer. These patients may still be actively treated the number of new drugs for colorectal cancer in the last 10 or 20 years has just exploded. There are multiple new chemotherapy drugs available such as Camtazar, Zalota, and Aloxetin. And there are more new molecular targeted drugs such as Herbitux and Vectabix. And in fact at this time there are at least seven categories of drugs which include traditional chemotherapy drugs, drugs against molecular targets such as EGFR, VEGF or VEGF or small molecular drugs that will inhibit the kinases or other molecular pathways. This area of so-called molecular targeted drugs is likely to grow and grow in the future. There is an improvement in the overall survival over the last 30 years. This probably reflects earlier diagnosis and more modern treatment. The overall survival by stage is noted. Patients who present with local stages have a good cure rate which does fall down a bit with regional and with distant it's quite poor. Again all of these survival curves can be paused or stopped to review both colon and rectal cancer. The five-year survival from the National Cancer Database is shown here as well. There is a website called adjuvantonline.com. This can be useful to calculate the benefit of a specific patient receiving chemotherapy and it would show the benefits or prolonged survival by adding chemotherapy after surgical treatment for colon cancer. All the details can be found on the website of aboutcancer.com.